Alexa, please prepare a bourbon. Preparing your bourbon now. Just one no. moment. No. No. How do I get this? Maddie, if you see this, I want this for Christmas. I want this somehow for Christmas, but with sparkling water. Figure it out, Maddie, please. This is the original device that was stuffed inside the table from that first clip. And much to my surprise, it went a little viral. This thing gained millions of views, the attention of larger creators, more comments than I could read in a lifetime, and eventually a very unexpected call from one of the largest companies in the world. Yeah, so we all saw your video. We loved it, and we wanted to know if you could make something like this for us. The last nine months have been crazy, but they've ultimately led me to this. But we need to start from the beginning. So Amazon wanted me to build one of these to be the bartender at their upcoming event and serve all the drinks for everyone. But if I'm gonna give one of these to Amazon, it's gonna need a complete redesign. Don't get me wrong, it works, but it's not without its issues. Whoa. So how was I gonna turn this polished turd into something worthy of our corporate overlords? First, I needed to identify all the issues with this current design. And with Amazon reaching out only six weeks before this event would be needed at, I was gonna have my work cut out for me. So the best place to start was going to be the size. This needs to fit into a regular bar top, so currently this thing is way too big. So I made it smaller, but that's still not small enough. I knew I needed to take a completely different approach. It was time to abandon the aluminum extrusion frame that this was built with. Aluminum extrusion is great for a lot of applications, but it isn't exactly space efficient and you're very limited on the shapes you can create with it. Whereas 3D printing, although it takes more design work, you can get a lot more creative with the shape and space you have to fit everything. And since I do have a 3D printer in my closet, I could use these advantages to really shrink down the design and eliminate potential failure points in the original design, like the nozzle that flipped down. So I began my new design for a 3D printed housing, and this took a lot of iterations, and I mean like a lot of iterations until I finally had a much smaller, but still totally adequate, design for the device. With the new 3D printed housing, I was able to eliminate a few of the issues with that first design. But now I needed to figure out how I was gonna take all the stuff from this first design and fit it into this much smaller housing. A key issue here was gonna be all these wires. Listen, I know my wire management skills are about as good as it gets. But if we're gonna fit everything in the new shell, we're gonna have to do better. And that's where a PCB steps in. PCBs are those little green boards you find in pretty much every electronic device you own. These boards can take a rat's nest of wiring like this and turn it into a single package no bigger than a credit card. So designing a custom PCB would go a long way in getting everything to fit in the new housing. Just one problem. I have no f***ing idea how to design a PCB. But I'm supposed to be a smart guy, right? And I built the original circuit, so I figured a cup of coffee, a couple of YouTube videos, and I'd have this PCB design knocked out in a couple hours. More than just a couple hours of struggle later, I discovered that I am in fact not a smart guy. With the Amazon deadline approaching, I didn't have time to get a degree in electrical engineering. So instead of preparing the PCB files myself, I drew the circuit by hand like a scrub and sent it to somebody who actually could make these files. After that, these files go off to a PCB manufacturer and I just have to wait for them to be delivered. While I waited for the circuit boards, I needed to think about how Amazon was gonna be able to interact with and control the device. Just like the original video, this thing's gonna be stuffed inside of a piece of furniture and it's not gonna be very accessible. Since this was being sent to Amazon for one of their events, obviously the Alexa had to be the primary way you'd call for a drink. But what about things like controlling LEDs, locking the device to keep thieving hands out, or changing the pore size? specifically changing the pore size. Changing the pore size was possible on the first device, but you had to go in and actually change the code, which isn't the most convenient solution. And after being called a pussy a few thousand times by the internet, I figured I needed to make this a little easier. I mean, people were like seriously upset that I didn't fill the glass more. So I threw together a mobile app that lets you control every detail of the new device, including the pore size. Now I can pour as much as I want just by moving the slider up or down. That's right, you too, Darren. And just a quick PSA, bragging about how much you drink on the internet is mega lame, but circuit boards are super cool, and they had just arrived. <laughs> 
The arrival of these circuit boards highlighted one of the biggest challenges with this entire project. See, this board was actually designed when the device looked like this. But after all the iterations, now it looks like this. And because of all these changes, this board was not going to work in the current design. When you're designing something, making a change to any one piece means about a hundred other things need to be changed to accommodate this original change. And then you need to make changes for the changes and so on. So as you design, you need to make sure that things stay flexible. And this is all to say that I needed to be able to change the PCB design as the overall device changed. But since we now know I can't do this myself, and paying for a bunch of revisions was far too expensive, this was beginning to seem like an insurmountable obstacle. With the fate of the entire project relying on this custom circuit board, I was beginning to worry that Amazon was going to get nothing but an apology email. Feeling like I was flogging a dead horse, I did what any egocentric person would do and went to my comments for some motivation. You are such a sad excuse of it. People are so lazy. I swear, society is so lazy now with all this new technology. What a total waste of money, you lazy slob. Waste of money. I don't care about you. I bet this guy has a cat. I'd beat Alexa's ass. I'd pee on your floor. And among all these comments is where I finally found my answer. Not sure if you need it, but I'm a PCB designer and I'd be happy to help. Yes, my wonderful YouTube commenting angel. Yes, I do. So Matt and I shook hands, he took my mess of a circuit design, and began creating a much better version specifically for the new device. With that being handled, I needed to turn my focus back to usability, specifically Wi-Fi connection and the Alexa integration. First, I need to explain how the original version worked. Version 1 used an ESP8266 chip to connect to the internet. To set this up, you had to go into the firmware and hard code your Wi-Fi credentials. Then when the device was powered on, it would use the credentials to find and connect to the correct network. And this works just fine if you're the creator of the device, but it won't work if you're giving it to someone else since they can't access the firmware. To fix this and make it usable for Amazon, we're going to utilize our handy dandy mobile app and use a method called Wi-Fi provisioning. This is going to be really important later, so let me explain a little bit about what Wi-Fi provisioning is. When the device first starts up, it's going to act as an access point, just like the router for your home internet. And then using the mobile app, you can connect directly to the device using your phone. From here, you just type in your Wi-Fi information, and then the device stops acting as an access point and instead just becomes a regular Wi-Fi connected device. Okay, great. The device can now connect to the internet, but how are we going to get it to connect to Alexa? Well, the first version didn't actually connect to Alexa directly. If you look closely at the original video, you'll see a computer with a weird retro looking screen. This is an old laptop that was converted into a dedicated home server. Its sole purpose was acting as a translator between the end table and the Alexa servers. Essentially, I would talk to Alexa, which would then talk to the home server. The home server would then decipher what was requested and send the correct signal over to the table itself. The table takes this information and begins making the drink you requested. And again, this works, but it requires some serious setup and writing custom scripts to the DIY home server. So to get around this pain in the ass, I instead enlisted the help of my JavaScript guru friend and we cobbled together an Alexa skill. These are essentially just apps within the Amazon smart home environment. I won't bore you with the details of how this works, but here's a clip I got from 3 a.m. when we finally got this working just a week before the Amazon event. Pour me a drink. No f way, Bill. That was instant. Dude, that was so quick. And it it got the uh, the pour size update, no problem. And there it is, cycle completed. Uh, this is the most satisfying feeling of all the feelings. Like three hours ago, I was sitting there, I was like, damn. The board doesn't work. The skill's not ready yet. Like, this is not good. With just about every improvement implemented in only a matter of days until this thing needed to be shipped, all there was left to do was to build the final version of what I've decided to call the Servita. I wish I could say that from this point forward, everything worked exactly as expected but that just wouldn't be honest. See, making something that does something is really pretty straightforward, but making something that does something reliably can be extremely difficult. And this usually involves a lot of things not working the way you expected them to, troubleshooting why that may be, Ooh. getting frustrated, and trying again. On the Servita, these bugs range from coding errors to incorrect electrical components to a weird issue that caused the whole device to lock up and have to be completely disassembled if the cup went down too far. And in each of these cases, I wasn't exactly sure how to fix it. But creating things isn't about knowing what to do. It's about learning what not to do through trial and error. You don't have to be some sort of savant to bring your ideas to life. You just have to be curious, persistent, and unbelievably stubborn until eventually 
you accidentally get it right. Obviously, I couldn't give away the first ever Servita, so I installed this one into a wine bar for my apartment. Besides, I need to do some real life testing, right? Let me show you some of the upgrades. First and most obvious, you'll notice there's a whole lot less wires, giving it a much cleaner look and making it a lot less likely that it'll accidentally destroy itself. I added physical buttons so you don't always have to rely on Wi-Fi, and also because I personally like the nonchalant nature of buttons. Because of the buttons, I wanted a way to make sure the system wouldn't run if they were accidentally pressed when the whole thing's not in use. So to lock it out, I just have to click this lock button and now the system will not run no matter what method you use to call for a drink. Along with the buttons, I added a much better LED control system and now things like color and brightness can be controlled right from my phone. This thing can serve two different drinks, so I set up this wine bar with both bourbon and red wine. Sort of like a his and hers type of deal, except in my case, it's more of a me and mine situation. And of course, the biggest upgrade of all, it now natively connects directly to Alexa. Enough of me bragging about my cool new wine bar. What about Amazon? Well, I made a second Servita, and with everything working perfectly and only a few days before the event, it was time to pack it up, ship it out, and hope for the best. But of course, the best never happens. Only 16 hours before showtime, I got a call saying the device wouldn't connect to the internet. And this is really bad because without the internet, there is no Alexa. And no Alexa means a very unhappy Amazon. After a short attempt at troubleshooting, I had literally no idea what could be causing this issue, so I booked the very next flight out to Seattle. After pulling an all-nighter, I landed in Seattle and arrived on site with only three hours until game time. I don't have much footage of what happened next because I was singularly focused on trying to get this working. But here's how this went. I had three hours until people were gonna be arriving ready to have a robot bartender make their drink. The first hour I spent just getting my laptop set up to even be able to program the device. The second hour was spent giving half-hearted reassurances to Amazon that I would get everything fixed and panicking because I couldn't even figure out what needed to be fixed. And then came the third and final hour and I was faced with an impossible decision. At this point, I only had one theory as for what could possibly be causing the connection problems, but honestly, I wasn't super confident in it. With my last hour, I could either rewrite the firmware to make it bypass the whole Wi-Fi setup function so that it would at least work with the buttons, or I could chase my theory and try to get everything working. But there was not time to do both. After a moment of consideration, I remembered an old adage. It, we ball. So for the final hour, I chased my one and only theory in an effort to get everything working. And remember earlier when I said Wi-Fi provisioning was gonna be really important later on? Well, here it is. Wi-Fi provisioning may make adding your Wi-Fi credentials as easy as just typing them in, but I began to wonder if maybe deleting them out wasn't as simple as just deleting the text. And after some research, this looked like it was probably the case, and you need to run some code to completely wipe the old Wi-Fi credentials off of the chip so that it can take new ones. So I needed to find and implement some code to fully erase the old Wi-Fi information. And with 15 minutes on the clock, everything needed to work first try. I found some code online, made some changes, and hit upload. And when I say this came down to the last second, I mean it literally. As the horde of people were beelining across the banquet hall to come see this thing in action, I was watching the upload bar slowly tick up, and right as the first guy stepped up to get his drink made, I saw the indicator LED flash rapidly before holding a steady blue. Connected. I breathed the biggest sigh of relief I think I will ever experience, looked at the guy to my right, and said, see, told you I'd get it working. Alexa, open Servita Bartender. Oh, that was a Make me a margarita. Sure, pour me a margarita. Wait, is it all pre-made and it's pouring? Yeah. 